Suppose you have these two flasks. One is 5 liters and the other is 3. You're asked to measure exactly 4 liters of water using only these two flasks. The flasks are not graded and you cannot use your estimation skills since you need to measure exactly 4 liters of water. What do you do? Well, if you give this problem some time, you might arrive to the solution I'm about to present. First, you fill the small flask. You pour the water to the big flask. You fill the small flask again, pour again. This time you'll be left with one liter of water in the small flask. You empty the big flask. You pour the one liter of water to the big flask. You fill the small flask again and pour the water to the big flask. This way you'll be left with four liters of water in the big flask. You might ask yourself questions like, why did this work? Would this have worked with three and six liter flasks? And is there some method you can follow to always solve this problem? So how do you answer these questions? The best approach to answer questions like this is to first get a sense of the problem. And to do so, we need to try stuff out and look for patterns. So let's start doing that. Let's assume that our flasks have volumes of A and B liters and that A is greater than B. I'm gonna do some random actions now. Try and follow them and make sure that everything is correct. Here, I'll assume that B is greater than the empty part in the big flask. A similar assumption was also made here. I'm making these assumptions because they give more interesting cases. Not making them would have resulted in a flask having the sum of water in both flasks and the other being empty. This process of taking actions that take you from one state to another, where there's a goal state you want to reach, is very similar to how some games work, like tic-tac-toe for example, or something more complex like chess. Our state here would be the amount of water in each flask, which can be written like this, and our actions are things like pour from A to B, or fill flask A for example. This right here is a summary of all the states that we reached in our investigation. Now let's look for patterns. If you look carefully at the amounts of water in the flasks, you realize that they can all be written in the form of some integer multiplied by A, plus some integer multiplied by b. Let's call these integers s and t. s and t can be positive, negative, or zero. An empty flask, for example, can be represented by setting s and t to zero. This form actually has a name. It's called an integer linear combination of a and b. But I'll just call it a linear combination sometimes because we're only dealing with integers. Now I'm going to prove that we can only get integer linear combinations in this puzzle, and we can get things like 2 and a half a minus 2 thirds of b for example. I'm going to approach this proof by considering all the types of actions we can make, and see if any one of them can generate something that is not an integer linear combination. There are actually three types of actions we can make. They are filling, emptying, and pouring. The way to start is by first assuming that we have integer linear combination amounts of water in the flasks, and see if any of those actions can change that. I know it might look somewhat weird to assume something that we're trying to prove, but bear with me for now. It's obvious why the filling and emptying actions will not change that property, but what about the pouring action? There are two ways to pour water in this puzzle. The first is when you pour till the flask you're pouring from becomes empty, and the other way is when you pour till the flask you're pouring into becomes full, while there's still water in the flask you poured from. In the first case, one flask will be empty, while the other flask will have the sum of water in both flasks. We saw earlier that zero is an integer linear combination. The sum of two integer linear combinations will also be an integer linear combination because the new coefficients will just be sums of integers. 
The second case where you pour till the other flask is filled is a little bit more challenging. The way to tackle it is by giving labels to the amounts of water in the flasks, like F1 and F2 here. F1 and F2 are integer linear combinations. We also need to determine how much was initially empty in the flask we want to fill. That's just the volume of the flask minus the amount of water in it, B minus F2 here. That's the amount that will be deducted from the pouring flask. So the new amount of water in the pouring flask will be this. That's just addition and subtraction of integer linear combinations, which will also be an integer linear combination. We now know that any action we take on a state with integer linear combinations will give us another state with integer linear combinations. But how do we finish the proof? Well, we know that we always start with empty flasks, and that zero is an integer linear combination. So we always start with a state that has integer linear combinations. Any action we take from here will give us another state with integer linear combinations. And any action we take after that will also give us a state with integer linear combinations, and so on. The proof is now done. This type of proof is called induction. Induction is used to prove that some property will always be true after any number of steps, just because it was true at the very beginning. So why all this talk about linear combinations? Well, it turns out that linear combinations tell us exactly what to do to get the amount of water we want. For example, 4 equals 3 times 3 minus 1 times 5. This is basically saying, fill the 3 liter flask 3 times and empty the 5 liter flask once and you'll get 4 liters of water. If you go back to the beginning of the video, this is exactly what we did. 4 is also equal to 2 times 5 minus 2 times 3. Try and see how you can get 4 liters of water this way. And also think why we can never get 4 liters of water using 3 and 6 liter flasks. The main part of the explanation is now done, but there's one more cool idea I want to explore, and that's the relationship between the greatest common divisor of two numbers and the linear combinations you can make from these two numbers. The greatest common divisor of two numbers is the biggest number that divides both these numbers. For example, the greatest common divisor of 12 and 18 is 6. We get something interesting when we divide the linear combination of A and B by the greatest common divisor, here written as g. Because g divides both a and b, and because s and t are integers, this whole term will be an integer. This means that g not only divides a and b, but also divides any linear combination of a and b. Or in other words, every linear combination of a and b is a multiple of their greatest common divisor. And that's precisely why it's impossible to get 4 liters of water using 3 and 6 liter flasks because the greatest common divisor of 3 and 6 is 3 and 4 is not a multiple of 3. But you might ask yourself, is the opposite of this statement true? Is every multiple of g a linear combination of a and b? Or for that matter, is g itself a linear combination of a and b? Well, since g divides any linear combination of a and b, then it has to be less than or equal any linear combination. Think about the smallest linear combination we can get from a and b. g is also less than or equal this number. Let's call this number m. g is less than or equal to m, or m is greater than or equal to g, however you want to look at it. So if g is a linear combination of a and b, then it has to be equal to m. Pause the video and think about it for a second, if it doesn't immediately make sense. The next logical step now is to see if m, like g, divides both a and b. Let's give it a try. Dividing a by m gives some quotient plus a remainder divided by m. Or it could be written this way. a equals q times m plus r. This is basically saying that A is composed of Q copies of M plus some remainder, and that remainder is less than M. And if that remainder is zero, 
then m divides a perfectly. We know that r is a minus qm, and that's just addition and subtraction of linear combinations, which means that r itself is a linear combination of a and b. But r is less than the smallest linear combination of a and b. This can only mean that r is 0, and that m divides a. The exact same argument can also be made for b. So we now know that m is a common divisor of a and b. But is it the greatest common divisor? We saw earlier that m has to be greater than or equal to g, and there is no common divisor greater than the greatest common divisor. This means that m is in fact equal to g, and the greatest common divisor of any two integers is their smallest linear combination. What does that tell us about our puzzle? Well, because all linear combinations are multiples of g, and that g itself is a linear combination of a and b, this means that we can only get amounts of water in our puzzle that are multiples of g. We were able to get 4 liters of water using the 3 and 5 liter flasks because the greatest common divisor of 3 and 5 is 1, and 4 is a multiple of 1. Thank you for watching.